Today we're starting a, we've been in 1 Corinthians for I think 11 weeks now <clears throat> and we're still in 1 Corinthians today but for the next four weeks we're going through one chapter, chapter 7 and it's kind of like a four part sermon. So one, one-ish sermon in, in four parts because there is a lot to tackle. We didn't want, we didn't want to just go with like from the start to the end and, and break it up like that although It'll, it'll basically be like that. We do need to go back and forth between various parts of the chapter to be able to cover all of the things of the chapter. And so if you get to the end of today and you think, I feel like there's much more in chapter seven than that. Yes, this will be the end of, like there's be one quarter of the sermon by the end of today. We're gonna to be covering over the next couple of weeks, marriage, sex, separation and divorce. We're gonna talk about abuse. We're gonna talk about singleness. And we're going to talk about going between some of those stages and phases of life because that's what Paul does in this chapter. And so for some it might be a, for all of us, I think it's going to be a very meaty, meaningful chapter because it's in the Scriptures and written uh, for us today, even though to the Corinthians in the first century, uh, by, by well, through at least by Paul, uh, ultimately by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we know it's also for us today and so we want to learn and grow and conform ourselves to the likeness of Jesus and His commands and order as we, as we see it in Scripture. And so uh, for some of you, this might be a really heavy day or next week might be a very heavy day or the week after even uh, when we're talking about singleness and maybe you, you're longing to be married or perhaps if we're talking about Marriage and your marriage is not, not just not in a good place, but in a very bad place. Uh, we're going to talk about, again, um, separation and divorce next week. It's going to be a big month. And so my hope is that our goal, as always is, we want to see and read, in, read, read Scripture and go and be doers of the Scriptures, not just hearers or readers. They would see these things and go, the, God has made us a particular way. And he's called us into a particular kind of life. He saved us even into his kingdom and into his family. He's ordered things for our joy, for our flourishing, for our collective good and for his glory. And so we want to we know his ways and live in his ways. That's our goal as we read through this chapter. <clears throat> and so again, I just want to acknowledge up front, we'll talk about it as we go through as well, that today we're going to be talking about a lot about marriage. Well, actually a lot about sex and a little bit about marriage. Ah, oh, maybe half and half. And I, I know for some, that might be a really difficult thing to talk about or to hear. It might be a thing, again, that you, you have a, a longing for marriage, perhaps. Uh, or you've been married and you are no longer married. Uh, again, ultimately, I, th- I think part of the reason Paul places this like right in the heart of his letter, not right at the front, He's just spent multiple chapters reminding people of the love God has for them, like how good and how wonderful and how majestic and mighty He is, how holy and otherly He is, but how invested and imminent and intimate He is with us, what He's done for us, how He's saved us, how He's redeemed us, how He has again invited us into His family, into union with Him into his ways. And so we want to know what are those ways? How can we live in those ways? So let me read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 7, then we'll pray. We'll get stuck into this first part of the sermon today. Again, Paul writing. Now, in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. If you're not reading right now, you won't know that was in quotation marks. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am, 
but each has his own gift from God. One person has this, this gift, another has that. I told you it was going to be a big week. Let's pray and uh, we'll see what God would have for us today. So again, Father, and as always, we need your help. We don't want to just import into your scriptures our own ideas or twist your word to make it say what we want it to say. We, we, we want to know your ways. We want to think like you think. We want to love what you love. We want to order our lives around your order. And so please help us today to see your good, your perfect will. Help us to gain understanding where we lack it. Conform our, correct us and conform us where we think otherwise or unhelpfully or destructively. And Father, in every way, help us to bring you glory with our thinking, with our loving and with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So sometimes in Paul's letters, he'll write, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of your full acceptance. Or he'll say, this is from the Lord. Statement. Sometimes you say, this isn't from the Lord. This is, this is from me. This is, this is my understanding. This is not a command. This is just how I understand life. Or this is how I like to lead. And other times you'll say, uh, again, this is not prescriptive from the Lord. This is, this is Paul speaking, but I do have the Holy Spirit. So it's probably a good idea to, to listen to what I'm saying. So there's all these different kind of categories of how Paul likes to write. Like he finishes the passage today by saying, I wish everyone was like I am. What he means by that, and as we'll come to see in the, in the coming weeks, he means he is unmarried. It's possible and perhaps likely that he had been married at some stage. But he'd go on to say things like, man, uh, when you're unmarried like me, I, I can just be singularly minded on the things of the Lord and uh, it doesn't matter if I go here, here, or here, or even die. I'm not then going to be leaving a wife or kids uh, without a provider or a protector, etc. He says, man... It, for, for me, my preference is, but then he, but then he says, but that's not, that's not a command. He says, to each, God has given a gift. And God gives very good gifts. So to some, he has gifted singleness, even though, especially in our culture, we don't think about it like this at all. And it might be offensive even to your ears to hear someone talk about, or the scriptures talk about singleness being a gift. And then to others, the gift is a spouse, a husband or a wife. And so Paul's not, he's not saying, man, <clears throat> nobody should get married. And we need to understand the different kinds of ways that Paul writes. In fact, as he's writing about marriage, he, he and again, we'll see this through this chapter into next week, the default, he, as he understands it, the default is that most people will get married. And so his concern is, if most people are going to get married, and if that's a good gift from God that we'll get married, it's important that we know what marriage is. What is it for? Why do we, why do we give and receive in marriage? What, what, what's the nature of a Christian marriage? How is it distinct? And how is it distinct from how other cultures understand marriage? And so he realises that each has his own gift from God. One person this gift, one person another gift. We're going to look at singleness specifically in two weeks' time. Today we're going to look at marriage. And in particular, Paul wants to talk about sex. Hello, if you've just walked in the door. <laughs> and so Paul starts this section talking about relationships in the church romantic relationships in particular, he starts by quoting the letter that they had written to him. The Corinthian church, if you've been around, if you've been with us for a little while, you know, they wrote to Paul regularly. Said, hey Paul, this is what's going on in the church in Corinth right now. Can you please help us out? Help us to understand what should we think about this or how should we go about this? Or this doesn't seem right to us. Do we need correction or rebuking or rectifying this matter to some degree? And so he quotes them. 
where they've written to him and said, it's not good for a man to have sexual relations with a woman. Or perhaps in your translation, it says, to touch a woman. It's not good for a husband to touch his wife. And by that, he doesn't mean like lay hands on her as, as we might say. They're specifically talking about having sexual intercourse, having sexual relationships, uh, relations with his wife. Because there was, a, there was, a, there was an understanding going around in Corinth in the first century that celibacy, even in marriage, was somehow more holy than people who were married and who had sex. So what Paul's not doing here is not prescribing it's better for a man not to have sexual relationship, relations with a woman. It's not better for a man to, have, to touch his wife. That's not what he's saying. He's quoting them, and it's kind of like a, head, a headline. Here's what you asked me. Now I'm going to speak to that. So please don't read that and hear Paul say, as a rule, a prescription to us, it's better to not have sexual relations. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, let's talk about the category of marriage. Let's talk about this question that you've asked. You've made this statement. Let me speak to that statement. Because the school of thought, again, the celibacy even in marriage was somehow more faithful and holy than engaging in sexual activity with your spouse. In reality, that way of thinking is kind of part Platonic dualism, part kind of Gnosticism, where the flesh is, e- is evil, and whatever's material is bad, and whatever s- spiritual is good. And so, if we can just never engage in the material, the, almost kind of the Eastern mysticism, uh, you, you can hear it in, in this claim that if you derive pleasure from the thing, it must be bad because material bad, spiritual good. And Paul's coming in and saying, no, 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 that's, that is not how it works. God has given marriage as a gift from the beginning, from the very beginning. He's saying deprivation doesn't prove holiness and an indulgence doesn't prove worldliness. It's not that the things that are pleasurable are bad for us and the things that suck are good for us. That may be true, but Paul's saying that's not necessarily true. Oh, you're not true. Uh, how, just from the previous chapter, from last week, we saw how God had made things. Wonderful. So the food is made for the body, the body for food. He said God has made things to work together. He has gifted us with wonderful gifts. Some of them spiritual, some of them material. It's, it's wonderful how He has created us. Sex too, made for our good, for our enjoyment. So the babies might be born so that we might have a deeper connection with our spouse. Sex in its right, like God-ordered context is wonderful and and great. So Paul is immediately saying, oh, you, you say that even in marriage, Corinthians, that you shouldn't have sex. Paul writes, let's just tackle that right from the beginning. That is, that's not what I'm saying. That's what Paul says. The thing is, at least sex is meant to be good. Like we saw last week, various categories like uh, the selfish sex, adulterous sex, abusive sex, homosexual sex. Paul has already told us last week, sex wasn't made for these things. And God isn't honoured when we participate in those kinds of sex. So some of the Corinthians obviously thought, well, if there are these kind of categories where sex is dishonouring and not good, although perhaps still pleasurable physically, maybe then we should just not have sex at all. And again, this is what Paul's speaking to. And so this is how he speaks it. He says, because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. So Paul is bringing order. So the, the disorder of the Corinthians, some of them at least, because some of them were sleeping with their stepmoms, so they were not averse to having sex. Others were like, well, we just shouldn't have sex at all. He's saying, no, 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 no. For everybody, wherever you are on, in that disordered view of sex, let's bring that into God's good order. Let's bring it into here. Who should men have sex with? Their wives, is what he's saying. Who should women have sex with? Their husbands. That's what he's saying. 
not the disordered sex outside of marriage, sharing spouses, sexual immorality like we, look, like we looked at last week and we'll look at again today. What is sex for? Man, it, the hard part about tackling a topic like sex in the context of marriage through the scriptures like this is that it doesn't cover all the bits that we need to talk about to make sure that uh, we're giving a better or a, a fuller or truer picture of what, this is, of what God's intention for sex is because this verse, this passage has been used by many to pursue and to cover for all kinds of abuses in marriage. And we don't want to we don't want to do that. We're people who want to enforce thing, a misunderstanding and a misapplication of Scripture, which then itself leads to a disordered, God dishonouring and even abusive and crushing engagement with sex. Uh, it's it's uh, dastardly. It's heinous. We don't want to do that. What is sex for? We read in places like Genesis 2, 24, Mark 10, 8, Ephesians 5. They all resound. They say, Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And so the, the therefore is because God has ordained marriage. And Paul speaks to this in Ephesians 5. He says, Man, you know, you know marriage, this thing that God did right from the beginning. Before sin, not as a concession to sin, but as part of God's perfect created order, he brought a man and a woman together, exclusively together in marriage, that they would become one flesh. And Paul says, this is a mystery and speaks to the mystery of the union between Christ and his bride, the church. And so in some sense, in a very real and meaningful sense, marriage is a prophetic witness to Jesus and his bride. And so we want, we want our marriages to truthfully, wonderfully, accurately and joyfully, prophetically present the goodness of the union between Christ and his bride. Primarily, sex is for bonding a husband and wife. It's unifying. It's healing. It's enjoyable. It's fun. Or it can be. It can be all of those things. It's supposed to be all of those things. And we want to be honouring of sex as we speak about it today. Often when people speak about sex, it's either in kind of hushed tones, as if we are somehow ashamed to talk about it or embarrassed to talk about it, or... Uh, often when people in our, just the culture around us talk about sex, it's, it's on the kind of real lavish, licentious, crude end of our speech. Physiologically speaking, studies found that in the 24 hours after having intercourse with someone, you emotionally bond. It's not just a physical bond. There's an emotional bond that forms as well. So brief... Uh, a brief view or overview of, uh, of this study. Uh, so Brian Sands, one of the authors, says oxytocin is a big factor, prim primarily um, you know, produced in the hypothalamus, so deep in the limbic system, if you understand uh, where that is in the brain. It's either released into the, into the blood via the pituitary gland or other parts of the brain and spinal cord. What happens is this oxytocin binds to the oxytocin receptors to influence your behaviour and even your physiology. So one, one um, study uh, by DeAngelis found oxytocin, it's dubbed the cuddle hormone or the love hormone, hormone because it does exactly that. It creates bonds, trust, creates generosity in us. So there's a physiological, a psychological response to having had sex with someone that makes you want to do th good things for that person. Whenever you feel comfort or security, there is a sense of oxytocin being involved. And so during and after especially sex, security, comfort, trust, generosity, they are all 
developed between the people who have had sex. It's the same hormone that produces, that mothers produce at childbirth to help bond with their new child. One of the prominent, prominent uh, figures in neuropsychology, Dr. Daniel Amen, he writes in his book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, is what he writes about sex. Whenever a person is sexually involved with another person, neurochemical changes occur in both their brains and that encourage limbic and emotional bonding. Yet limbic bonding is the reason casual sex doesn't really work for most people on a whole mind and body level. This is a non-Christian talking, by the way. Two people may decide to have sex just for the fun of it, Yet something is occurring on another level they haven't decided on at all. Sex is enhancing an emotional bond between them, whether they want it or not. One person, often the woman, is bound to form an attachment and will be hurt when a casual affair ends. One reason is it's usually the woman who's hurt the most is because the female limbic system is larger than the male's. So what the studies tell us is what God had designed from the beginning is that sex in its right context would be not just a physical, mechanical, material gratification of sexual desire or or bodily urges, but that is, it's a bonding agent. It brings people, husband and wife, together. The intimacy that they have is ratified and bolstered by and through sex. And the body and the mind changes when we have sex. It is by God's good design. Sex is an expression of intimacy meant for our good, our joy, our pleasure, and to strengthen us in marriage. Another researcher, Alice Frank, writes, sex is an expression of intimacy, shouldn't be the means to, or the primary means to intimacy. True intimacy springs from verbal and emotional communication. True intimacy is built on the communication, uh, sorry, the commitment to honesty, love, and freedom. True intimacy is not primarily a sexual encounter. So again, sex is best in that committed, consensual, exclusionary relationship, or exclusive relationship between a husband and a wife who... who are growing in intimacy and then sex is an expression of and it's an outworking of that intimacy that then also builds the intimacy that then is expressed in many ways and including sex, which then builds the intimacy and a husband and a wife are built up in love and in trust for one another. In our culture, sex has been elevated pretty much to the most important and defining characteristic of every human. The the Bible doesn't put it there, but our culture does. It's the most important thing you can do. It's the most important part of your identity. It's the high watermark of human experience. And so if there's something that's preventing you from having sex on your terms, then you are being deprived of something necessary for human flourishing. The Bible never talks about it in this sense. We'll talk about this in a couple of weeks when we're looking at singleness. Sex isn't made for this. Sex can't bear the burden of the demands our culture makes on it, which is why people in our culture are consistently dissatisfied with sex. Always searching for something else. It can't satisfy the demands the culture places on it. But because sex is so, this, this way of thinking about sex is so prevalent in our culture, and because we have personal experience of sexual urges, and you may have had experience of sexual pleasure before, uh, we receive as true this cultural fallacy that sex is what life and relationships is all about. It's not. It's an important part. I'm not trying to minimise it. I'm trying to put it in its proper, rightly ordered place. We have the inverse of the problem of some in Corinth. Some in Corinth, uh, for, some, for some of them, denying sex is what made you fully you. Denying sex is what made you whole. Denying sex is what made you holy. In our culture, actually having the sex you want is what's going to make you whole. Having the sex that you want on your terms is what's going to satisfy and fulfill you. And both of these things 
are false. The gospel of our culture, so the, the gospel that our culture preaches is a sex-based gospel. So the good news of sexual identity and expressive individualism where hell is sexual repression and denying yourself and conforming to a biblical sex ethic. Heaven, rather, is conforming to a worldly sex ethic where you're no longer bound by God's ordering, which will then lead to your sexual liberation and fulfilment. It's not only a false gospel, it's a gospel that always lets you down. There's no power in that gospel. It's a lie. And again, puts demands on sex, which God created good. Again, God created the good. But it placed demands on sex that it was never intended to be able to live up to. And so Paul goes on, he says, A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. In the same way, uh, a wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another. And again, I'm aware of, I've heard personal testimony of, in particular women, who have said, my husband has whipped this verse out and said something along the lines of, and therefore you owe me, or you must, or God says, which is a horrific misuse and abuse of Scripture and of your wife. In a marriage where the husband and the wife have mutual love, mutual respect, mutual desire for the good of one another, like preferring the needs of the other, a mutual desire to become more like Jesus, where the purpose and place of sex is understood uh, as an order of Oh, sorry, as, a, as an expression of enjoyment, expression and enjoyment of intimacy, I should say. Where a marriage is healthy like this, this kind of thing works great. Where all those conditions are met, mutual love, mutual respect, mutual desire, desire for the good of one another, mutual desire to become more like Jesus, where the purpose of sex is understood and its proper place and order as an expression and enjoyment of intimacy is known, this can work really well. Sex is primarily about the, the bonding. Sex is about giving and about receiving. It's about giving yourself. It's about me wanting the good of another, a specific other, my spouse. Because of the intimate design and mutuality of sex, it's not just about giving, it's also about serving your spouse by receiving. So sex is giving and receiving. But it's a mutual giving and receiving. It is never taking. Not God-honoring sex. Not, not in the context that I just said. Not, not in a healthy marriage. Sex is voluntarily, consensually saying, I give myself of, to you. And it's saying, because I love you, I, I am also receiving your giving yourself to me. And sex in that context is wonderful and beautiful. There's no taking in God honoring sex, only mutual giving and receiving. Sex, man, it must always be consented to, even in marriage. A wedding ring and a marriage certificate is not a, you know, again, you can't pull out this passage in the marriage certificate and say, you owe me, you must, I demand. I, I will take, I will extract my, my sexual gratification from you. That's, that's, that is not, I'm not trying to heap shame and guilt on you if you've, if you've been like this in the past, but we may need to have a conversation. But I'm trying to say that is not what this God-honoring marriage looks like. Paul's helping the Corinthian church, understand the place of sex in marriage. It's a helpful reminder of what, what sex is for. The sex is for marriage. He's saying, man, you're going to have temptations. You're, you are beholden to one another. Actually, I, don't, I can't exercise authority over my own body because that belongs to my wife and her body to me. 
And so he's saying, man, there are enough temptations already. Don't disorder your marriage and invite temptation by neglecting this aspect of your marriage. And again, we will talk about unhealthy marriages in a minute. I'm only talking about healthy marriages now. In healthy marriages, you can think, read this and go, yes, my body belongs to my wife and I want to honour her with it, both by not joining my body to some other woman and also working hard to serve her with my body. That's what Paul is saying here. And, in, and, and the same true for my wife in healthy marriages. Paul's explicit in the passage again, my body isn't my own. I have been purchased by Jesus, actually. Like we saw last week, my body is primarily for him. And I bring him glory by living in his order that he has invited me into with my wife who has exclusive rights to my body. I can't give it to another. And I can't just decide to withhold sex from my wife for my own selfish reasons. There are many reasons that husband and wife may decide to not have sex, but I can't just decide because my body's not my own. I can't just say, well, no. And you might say, well, what does that mean about consent? Let's get into it. When I say, well, let's, let, me, let me talk about some other reasons. What are some other good reasons in a healthy God-honoring marriage, God-honoring marriage to not have sex? This is not an exhaustive list. Paul has one in particular that he'll highlight. Things like illness from a momentary headache, injury, even mental health, pain or dysfunction, recovery from childbirth or surgery, medication, chronic illnesses, those kinds of things are, can all be really great reasons. Again, you don't whip out the Bible and say, you must. A primary care, a primary care is for our spouse, for the flourishing that I would act for the good, for the flourishing, for the joy of my spouse. And in particular, for husbands, where Paul writes, what does the marriage of Jesus and his bride look like for the man? It looks like laying down your life for your bride. Laying down my personal wants, desires, my any selfishness is gone in service of my wife. If, there, if, if this is like a short-term illness, there's understanding and care and love and hopefully a later coming together when that illness is gone. If this is a long-term or chronic illness, there's still understanding and loving and care and I'll put it to you and asking for help. Other reasons might be tiredness or being run down or stress. Again, valid reasons to say, let's not. But if tiredness or run down or stress is a constant feature, then I would look at this passage and say, okay, we might need to make some lifestyle changes to deal with the tiredness and the stress and the being the run down. Uh, just not in the mood, valid reason. Valid reason. Actually not feeling it right now. Valid reason. But again, if that's the constant theme in the marriage, uh, then this is where I think Paul's letter saying, my body's not my own. I'm not in the mood. That's where I start to go, okay, I'm not in the mood today, valid reason. Not in the mood tomorrow, valid reason. Not in the mood for six months. We probably need to make some changes because my body's not my own. I can't just keep dishonouring my wife in this way because I'm just not in the mood. So I'm, I'm in no way trying to mess with consent in that regard. What I'm saying is, if these are consistent and chronic and ongoing things, Paul's warning is that sex is good and healthy in marriage and should be seen as a regular part, like a regular rhythm. I'm not talking about frequency. I'm just talking about a regular rhythm of the life of any husband and wife. And where that rhythm is broken, there are problems more than just in the bedroom. And prayer, he says specifically prayer. He says, don't deprive one another, except where you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 
Note again how Paul says that the godly sex life in marriage is agreed upon. They've spoken about it. They've had the conversation. Again, I I, want to highlight again the necessity for consent in marriage, that we talk about these things, that sex is always a voluntary giving and a voluntary receiving of a gift. Paul says, when you agree together, you say, we are together going to say we're going to abstain from having sex for a period of time so we can devote ourselves to a particular thing. Again, like we talked about last week, where you might uh, abstain from eating for a particular time to say to your body, uh, I am your, I'm your master, you're not my master. I'm not defined by and subject to my urges, but I am the master of my urges and I have bridled my desires and I direct them where I want them to go. And Paul says, we can agree to, th- to do that together. We can say, okay, we're, we're going to agree upon this thing. There's always a sense of mutuality in God's design for sex. It's not selfish. Even when there's a kind of fasting involved, it's, a, it's agreed upon. And it does take work. This kind of romantic notion that we get from perhaps uh, movies or media where sex will always be spontaneous and, and amazing and uh, fun and wild and full of romance and whatever. Uh, I mean, if that is true of you, that's great. I, I put it to you, that is, that's not actually, I would say, how sex is designed to just be like that where it's unthinking, animalistic, pure instinctive. No, I think it's actually, again, it comes out of intimacy. And so that, that may mean, again, if we come back to that previous one of, well, I'm actually tired all the time. I, just, I cannot do it. Then we might need to come back and say, okay, let's talk together. What changes are we going to make in our life? What changes are we going to make to our that the, uh, the rhythm of our sex life, maybe having sex at different times of the day when we're less tired, or I'm going to stop watching so much TV, or we're going to not watch TV in this block of time, or not at all, or I need to exercise less at different times of the day, or I might need to, whatever it is. I'm not trying to, be, again, I'm not trying to be prescriptive. I'm trying to get down to the principle of that sex is a really good and I'd say essential, where it's, where it's possible, it's an essential part of a marriage. And where the regular rhythms of sex is broken, it is worth it to come together, have the conversations. And like I've said before, and like I'll say again, to get external help to speak into your marriage and including your sex life so that you can have a wonderful sex life. If you get romance, that's great, but make sure you have intimacy. Again, might take some awkward chats. Again, all of the above is for a husband and a wife in a healthy marriage. And it's worth asking your spouse, are we in a healthy marriage? Ask them. On the way home or later today, say, hey, let's have one of those awkward coming together, sit down conversations about our sex life. What about an unhealthy marriage? In a marriage where a husband and a wife are still selfishly pursuing their own desires, primarily. They're driven by their instinctive urges. They're not preferring the needs of the other. Where the purpose of sex is not understood or misunderstood and its proper, and proper place and order as an expression and enjoyment of intimacy is inverted. Trying to live... Trying to trying to live out these verses could be particularly destructive and damaging. Where sex is not, again, a a mutual giving and receiving, but it's a, I have needs. Meet my needs. Then trying to apply this and say, your body belongs to me, you must. Oh man, that's that's horrific. Actually, I, I hated saying that. In an unhealthy marriage, these verses have been used to promote and cover up for abuse, and even, man, leads into torturous relationships. 
maybe especially for women. Saying you have to have sex with me because the Bible says so <laughs> shows a lack of understanding of what sex is, what it's for, shows a lack of love, so it shows a lack of respect for your spouse, any kind of like cajoling or manipulating or coercing, obviously, so that you get sex, as if that was... As, as if that was the meaning of life, as if that, that's the high watermark of human existence, you've bought into the lie of the false gospel of the culture. And then you're just layering it with a veneer of Scripture so you get sex. That is not the wonderful order that God is inviting us into. This falls in the, into the category of, like we looked at last week, flattening out and someone who's made in the image of God, F flattening them down, a daughter of the king, stripping, of, stripping her of her perceived worth, her personhood, her sexual enjoyment, and of the love that she deserves from you by making her into an object for your own sexual gratification. We don't do this. That is, that's, there's no intimacy there. Not, not just a sexual intimacy. There's no intimacy at all there. There's no laying down your life for your bride, no loving like Jesus. There's no receiving. There's just taking, extracting, or being frustrated when your demand isn't fulfilled. We don't do this. We don't live like this. I'll put it to you. This is included in that, ca that broad category of sexual immorality, that porneia that Paul wrote about last week. And even if it doesn't necessarily reach the level of criminality and like disregarding consent, it dishonors God. And it prophetically paints an untrue picture of Jesus and his bride. And it crushes your spouse, even if she never says it. So again, ask your spouse, are we in a healthy marriage? To which category do we belong? Are we the ones for whom this passage is actually a wonderful, encouraging, challenging, corrective pursuit for us? Or is this for, one, is this for us something that would lead to crushing and abuse and despair? I say, this is hard to do by yourself. We need to do it in our, in our marriages. We need to ask this question. And then we need to work whatever the answer is. We need to put in the work after we get the answer. But I also want to encourage you to invite somebody into your sex life. Obviously not into your bed. But invite somebody into your, into your marriage to see, to see in. A trusted friend who loves Jesus, loves you, loves your spouse, loves your marriage. And ask in a way that honours your spouse, is this normal? Is this okay? How can I better love my husband? How can I better love my wife? Will you pray for me in this area? Man, even just asking that question, is this normal or is this okay? <laughs> is incredibly clarifying. And again, is why I say, make sure it's somebody who's trusted, who's not going to go speak with other people about it, who loves Jesus, who loves you, who loves your spouse and your marriage, who isn't just going to be like, nope, don't put up with that. You know, get out of there when it's actually something that's minor or fixable. And not someone who's going to say, well, you know, honey, you just got to put up with it and go for it. Neither of those is helpful. But we, we need help. Actually, you all need help. You can quote me on that. You all need help. We all need help. We've got to have people we can go to. Not everybody. Like, don't tweet about it or any of that kind of stuff. But we need to have trusted people. I like to have peers and elders, people who are older than me, further down the track than me, and peers, so that, so that I can ask, is this, is this okay? Is this normal? Uh, I highly recommend... You get people, trusted people in your corner to speak through these very things, especially if there's something in your mind that goes, ah, 
this doesn't seem right, or I don't enjoy this, or whatever it is. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover. I suspect, um, I suspect even just in this first week, we're really just opening up the can a little bit. So my apologies if this feels like an abrupt finish or we're just getting started. We are just getting started. But I do want to give some next steps here. Um, if you're in a healthy marriage, if you, if you heard what we said before and you're like, that, that does sound like me, praise God, keep going, disciple others. If you're in an unhealthy marriage, please know there is hope Repent when needed. Get help. There is so much good help. There's a lot of bad help, but there's, there's a lot of good help. Start working together. Pursue Jesus together. Do the hard work of growing and loving. It takes time and it is worth it. It's hard work and it's worth it. Don't miss out on an awesome marriage and an awesome sex life because you're too embarrassed about your struggles or failures to reach out and say, I need help. Thirdly, if you're in an abusive relationship, coercive, controlling, we, we are going to talk in greater depth about this next week. But don't wait until next week to reach out and get help. Even if, again, even if you just need that clarifying, you need to ask that clarifying question of, is this okay? Does this make sense? Is this normal? Please do it today. If you don't have a person you can go to, come to me or one of the elders or your discipleship group leader. We, we have done this kind of thing many times before. Uh, your trust is probably totally blown already. But, but can I say, please, tr please trust us. And in every category, please pray. Please pray. We want to be a community where all of our marriages, for those who are married, and again, marriage is a gift, singleness is a gift, we'll talk about this in two weeks, for those who are married, we present, we, we preach with our lives this prophetic vision of the relationship between Jesus and his bride that all of our marriages would be uh, on the way to, if not already shining, this prof prophetic proclamation of the goodness of God. How he's laid down his life for his bride. How he loves his people and has done everything necessary to save them, to restore them, and to have them. I'm assuming that some of the things we've talked about today may have opened up uh, feelings of embarrassment for some or guilt or shame for others, of, of, of wonder maybe for some, like, ah, I'm just not sure about that. And again, please speak to somebody today. We'll go into more of the specifics over the coming weeks, but don't wait for next week to find out if you know, what you're experiencing, experiencing is okay or not. Don't try to do life or marriage alone. Let's pray together. So Father, I want to firstly thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. That our groom, Jesus, is the perfect one. Who has loved us perfectly, serves us wonderfully, laid down his life, Again, perfectly. You're so very, very good to us. And so, Father, help us to put all of our hope, all of our trust, find all of our joy in Jesus. Please, Father, fill us with your spirit again. Help us to know, firstly, the, the intimacy, your, your intimacy through your spirit, your love by your spirit. Father, help us to love each other well. In particular, I'm asking for the husbands and wives among us. Uh, even just with, the, with this introductory topic today about sex, Father, my request is that uh, people in this church, the married couples, would have a really 
wonderful and God-honoring sex life. Help us to live in the order you've invited us into. Help us to love each other well. Help us, Father, to be givers. And, and in that mutual love and respect, to receive, lovingly receive, the lovingly given gift of our spouse. Lord, my next request is for healing, please. Bring healing where it's needed, physically, uh, emotionally, relationally in particular. For people who are uh, feeling shame or guilt today or embarrassment, Father, please, again, by Spirit, let them know your comfort. Let them know your peace. Let them know your presence and your intimacy. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake.